Okay, um, hi everybody, welcome to the pre-recorded lecture. Uh, so once again, let me explain why I'm doing this. Uh, I just originally decided when I planned this course that because it's the pandemic, then, well, for some people like myself, it's better, it's more convenient to can watch pre-recorded lectures. It's just because you can relax and then you can uh, go back and go forward and pause and twice the speed, all that stuff. Uh, but I also enjoy interacting with you, so that's why I'm doing the mixed version where Wednesday, Friday I'm doing live sessions, but Mondays I'm doing pre-recorded. And we'll see in a couple of weeks, I will run a poll. If you all hate it very much, then we're gonna just do live lectures. If you love it, then we'll try to, I don't know what we're gonna do, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, let me remind you what we did uh, on Friday, which for me was 10 minutes ago. Uh, so here's the definition. We were studying flag variety, and this lecture is going to be about the flag variety, and at the end I'm going to try to summarize all the examples we had so far and try to lean into cluster algebras. So there is going to be some suspense going on. Okay. So recall the definition of cluster algebras, of, sorry, of, of the flag variety. And the flag variety denoted f of n of c is the space of all flags, v0 inside v1, inside etc., inside vn, which is equal to cn, and the dimension of vk was equal to k for all k from 1 up to n. And so, as we discussed in class, uh, you can you can parameterize the set by choosing a matrix. So, in other words, uh, you can write the space of the flag variety as the set of all full. Well, you can just say GLN, GLN, GLN of C, which let me remind you is the well, it's the group. A group uh, of full rank, so invertible n by n, n by n matrices. And then I'm going to mod out on the left by lower triangular invertible matrices. Which forms a subgroup and somehow the quotient is becomes a kind of a manifold. And so, uh, well, one question that, that you may or may not wanna know is that, well, it would be nice to see what is the dimension of the flag variety. Because remember, the dimension of the Grassmannian, the dimension of the Grassmannian of K planes in the n-dimensional space was to k times n minus k and one of the ways to compute it was to you, you know you take a generic k by n matrix and then you and then you put it uniquely into this row echelon form and then you just count how many free entries do you get in the in the rectangle on the left and then that's k times n minus k so that's the generic case but it you need to attach some kind of lower dimensional pieces to this open cell. Now for the flag variety you can do a similar procedure. You can take, so uh, on the right there was a k by n matrix, here I'm going to take an n by n matrix. Let's say I take a matrix from GLN, it's dimension n squared, but then I'm going to apply these Lower so these lower triangular invertible matrices they act by row by downward row operations, and so the therefore for a generic matrix I can uniquely uh, put it in well that's called Gaussian elimination, and just put once on the diagonal zeros below the diagonal, and then these things can be any non any zero or non-zero entry. And in particular, if you have n rows and n columns, then the number of non-zero entries in this region is entries to. 
and I'm going to have to answer my questions myself. That's less interesting, but uh, well, it's still pretty interesting. Anyway, that's the dimension of the flag variety, n just 2, which is a nice combinatorial number. Now, um, so the next question that uh, I'm going to try to ask is, can we have any coordinates on the flag variety? Because here, remember, on the Grassmannian, we, ha we had Plucker coordinates. Coordinates, which were denoted P sub J, where J is a is a K element subset of bracket N. So the set of integers between one and n, and so so these are like the maximal minors of my matrix. But here, well, there is only one maximal minor, so that kind of doesn't make any sense. And the way you do that is you introduce flag minors, because remember the way you go from a matrix M to a flag is you take v sub k to be just equal to the span of the first uh, k rows of m. Right, and therefore, well, well, so for example, if I, if I only look at the first row, then these are gonna be some entries and they are, are almost already are coordinates, right? They're almost well defined, except that I can rescale the whole row by a non zero scalar. So, okay, let me try to define these Plucker coordinates. So, well, these are called the flag miners. Flag minor. So, here I'm going to take J to be uh, any subset of N, so of any size. There is no K anymore. So I just choose any subset of it, of, of the set, and then I define the flag minor P sub J to be by definition the the determinant the determinant of the submatrix of M with a row set bracket. Well, let's say bracket size of j what is this i'm, I'm t just taking the first several rows of my matrix the number of rows is such that the minor is square as it has to be so the column set is going to be just j and so in other words if this is my matrix m then my set j is let's say j is like one to four or something like this. Then I take the first, the second, and the fourth column, and I take three rows in each, and that's my minor. That this is the determinant of this is p one two four. So I specify one set, and then and that's the set of columns, and then the set of rows is just going to be the first k columns where k is the size of j. Okay, and so in other words, uh, P sub J is, well, in other words, if the size of J is equal to K, then P sub J is a Plucker coordinate of V sub K, which, so V sub K is an element of my flag, right, it's somewhere here but it's also a k-dimensional subspace of c to the n. And so v sub k as an element of the Grassmannian k comma n. Okay. And so in particular, uh, these Plucker coordinates satisfy these Plucker relations. Remember there was a three-term Plucker relations. Let, let me actually remind you. So for the Grassmannian, Kn, the Plucker relation 
well, the three term fluke correlation uh, was given by P S A C times P S B D is equal to P S A B times P S C D plus P S A D times P S B C, where uh, A B C D are linearly ordered and then none of them belong to S. And S, the size of S is k minus 2. So that's the, that's the three term plus relation in the Grassmannian. In particular, of course, if you say if the size of all j's is the same, then these are going to satisfy these relations. But now we have extra conditions, right? The, these kind of vi's in different Grassmannians, they are not independent from each other. The, the condition on v2 is that it has to contain v1. So the Plucker coordinates of v2 have to somehow be algebraically dependent with the Plucker coordinates of v1. So the let me just write down. It's also there is also a beautiful also three term Plucker relation for uh, for flag miners. So this for gross mining for flag miners. Uh, the relation is going to be well. So p s. What I'm going to choose. I'm j instead of four integers. I'm going to choose three integers, a less than b less than c, and then I'm going to choose a set S which does not contain a, b, and c. And then p s a c times p s b is going to be equal to p s a b times p s c plus p s a times p s b c. So, uh, the way you remember this is, if you kind of look at this picture, then, then these are like the diagonals of the quadrilateral, and these are the sides of the quadrilateral. While here, you know, there's a hole. Like on the left-hand side, there is, there's a hole between A and C, and a hole between B and D, and here it's the same. So somehow, if you draw A, B, C, then on the left you take A, C times B, so there's like a hole, but here you take a, B times C, and here you take A times B, C. So there's no holes here. Somehow the more holes your uh, miner has, the bigger it is. And so the more terms on the right-hand side it's going to be. Um, yeah, or whatever. I mean, it, there's just this relation. You can just memorize it. It's, it's pretty easy to memorize. And so let me give you an example just to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Let's say I take a 3x3 three three matrix. Well, if I take an arbitrary 3x3 three three matrix, just as I explained over here, if it's generic, I can apply downward row operations uniquely to get an, an upper triangular matrix with ones on the diagonal. So let me use this and just verify this relation for a generic element of the flag variety. So I take a matrix, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and then this is going to be x, y, and z. And then let me write down just all flag miners. And these are going to be of different sizes, so the, the miners of size 1 are going to describe uh, the first row, which is v1. So v1 is this vector, is linear span on vector 1 x y and so the Plucker coordinates are p1 is equal to 1 and p2 is equal to x and p3 is equal to y and these are defined up to multiplication by a common scalar now uh, p12 is equal to 1 and p13 is equal to z and p23 is equal to xz minus 1. So p23 is the determinant of, uh, I'm taking this submatrix, and p13 is the determinant I'm taking this submatrix. So it's always top justified. Okay, and similarly, so 
the first three minors are defined up to their scalar and the second the kind of the minors of size 2 are defined up to a separate up to, up to multiplication by separate scalar and finally there is p 1 2 3 which is equal to 1 So, okay, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to check this relation. And again, th that's kind of a general wisdom. If you, you can choose polynomial, you can check polynomial relations for generic matrices, for generic elements of your space. If they're, if they're true for like a generic element, then they're true for degenerate elements as well, because they are polynomial equations. And so uh, that's called the risky dance in algebraic geometric terms. And so uh, what am I trying to check? Okay, I'm trying to check this relation here. And in my, in my case, I'm gonna have S equal to empty set, and then A equal to one, B equal to two, and then C equal to three. And so my relations are, uh, let me copy this thing here. So SAC is going to be equal to S13 to just P13. P13 is equal to Z times B is equal to 2 and P2 is equal to X. So ZX is equal to P12 times P3. Uh, where is P3? Y plus P1. That's 1 times P2. 2, 3, that's x, z, minus 1. And you can see that this is indeed true. And that basically I have just checked it for any 3 by 3 matrix. Okay, so now you can, well, so you have this nice relation. And you have these coordinates which are flag miners. You can ask for example, uh, question one, what would be a cluster? So somehow you want to choose some kind of minimal possible number of flag miners so that only using this relation you can, re you can express all the other ones in terms of these cluster ones. And you want the ones in the cluster to be algebraically independent and yeah as you can see all these relations are subtraction free um, right. and so the second question which is closely related is you can define the you can take your flag variety and define the totally positive part right, by just saying that that's the set of all flag flags v bullet in the flag variety such that all Flickr coordinates, or, or in other words, you can take matrices and take flag minors of matrices, and all these flag minors are supposed to be bigger than zero. So again, this is defined up to a common multi multiplication by common scalar. So what this is actually saying is that for any two sets of the same size, the ratio of the corresponding flags uh, corresponding flag minors is strictly positive. And so, yeah, que question two is how many minors do I need to check? What's the minimum possible minors to check to make sure a given flag belongs to the totally positive su subset of, of the flag variety? And presumably these should form like an extended cluster. And so uh, let me try to remind you. That so for the, for the Grassmannian, for the Grassmannian two comma n, the extended the, the cluster or extended cluster was given by triangulations, which are combinatorial objects. Now for the general Grassmannian k comma n. I'm going to put question mark here. I'm going to tell you later. It's, it's really beautiful, but 
maybe later I'm going to study them in detail. But so far, let me, for the flag variety, it's going to be actually objects which are familiar to some of you, which are called wiring diagrams. So what are these wiring diagrams? Well, uh, the name is pretty... Uh, yeah, here is the definition. Let me show you a definition and perhaps should I show you an example? Well, basically what you do is you, let's say you take a rectangle and then you choose end points Let's say choose four points on the left and four points on the right. So these are end points here and then end points here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect them by curvy lines. I'm going to connect them by paths that go from left to right. And the condition is that these are going to be called wires. So the condition is that any two wires intersect exactly once. So that's the main condition. So let's say I have a red wire and therefore if they intersect exactly once they have to connect kind of. They have to connect uh, the points in the opposite order. So let me try to draw some diagram. Let's say all Let's say this goes, the red one goes like this, and then the blue one goes like this, and then let me choose a green one. Let's say it goes like this. Finally, the purple one would go something like this. Um, so again, any two wires intersect exactly once. And you can choose like the purple wire and the red wire, they intersect at one point. And there is also some other conditions like uh, no three wires intersect at a single point. So that's, yeah, I want all the intersections to be generic. And I also want them to like, start on the left boundary and terminate on the right boundary. And there is some other conditions like I want them to be, let's say, piecewise linear or smooth. I don't want a, a wire to kind of fill the whole rectangle, as many of you know is possible to do. Anyway, so I have some kind of wiring diagram like this. And this is called a this is called a wiring diagram. And then I'm going to label the wires. Let's say label them by the right in right end point. 1 4 3 then the green one is going to be 2. So Label each wire by its right endpoint. Okay, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to label the regions of the of the wiring diagram by sets. Uh, I'm going to label the regions by subsets of bracket n so in this case n in this case n is equal to 4 because i have four wires and so how do i label the regions by subsets of n well the rule is very simple uh, the label of a given region so by region, I mean uh, you remove the wires from the rectangle and then the rest splits into connected component. And these are called the regions. So this is a like a triangular region. This is another triangular region. Here I have a quadrilateral region. And 
and also have these boundary regions as well. Okay, so let's say I copy my wiring diagram. So the rule is that the label of the region is equal to the set of all, well, the wires are labeled, right? So set of all wires or labels of wires above this region. Let me choose some color. Yeah, I guess black is fine. So in other words, uh, I have the I have the region on top, right? Uh, somewhere here, and no wires are above this region. So I'm going to label it by the empty set. And now it becomes interesting. If I go to this region here, there is only one wire that's above it, and it's labeled by two. So I'm going to label this region by two. And if I go here, then there, the wires above are two and one. So I label it by set one, two. And over here, I only have the purple wire, which is labeled one. So let me just put, fill in the labels. One, this is going to be four. This is three, four. This is two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Uh, one, two, three. And then this is going to be, okay, here I'm going to have four, one, and two. One, two, four. And so let me let me denote by so this basically these labels are gonna be are gonna give me the extended cluster. So that somehow I started with some completely geometric object and then I started to ask these cluster algebraic questions, like these two questions. What is a cluster? What's a totally positive part? And it turns out that, well, of course I'm cheating a little bit because I came up, I just told you this rule, but this is a beautiful combinatorial rule. Um, so, okay, so what's the rule? Um, so let me say that the, so I choose some wiring diagram D, and then the cluster X of D is going to be given by the set of flag minors P sub J for J and interior region of D. Here by an interior region, I mean that it's not adjacent to the boundary of the rectangle. And similarly, well, you can guess the rest. Uh, frozen variables, frozen variables are P sub J for J a boundary region. which have a nice structure. If you look at the, uh, at the way the wires are adjacent to the boundary, then you're gonna see that it goes like empty set, then one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, etc. So it kind of, on the left, you see the left aligned subsets. And then on the right, at the right boundary, you see the right aligned subsets. So one, two, three, four, two, three, four, three, four, and four. So they kind of, they make like a cycle around the boundary. And that's easy to see because you know that the wires are labeled one, two, three, four on the right. And therefore, because any two wires intersect exactly once on the left, they are gonna be labeled four, three, two, one. So yeah, and that's it. Basically, you, now you can define an extended, extended cluster as usual, x tilde of d, it's just the, the x of d union with the frozen variables.
So in other words, in other words, x tilde of d is just the set of Plücker coordinates for all regions of d, either boundary or interior. Okay. Now, um, how does this answer any of my questions? Remember, I had two questions. Mm -hmm. no. The two questions were, what's a cluster? Okay, that question is answered. Uh, the first question, check. I have defined a cluster. But it has to still satisfy some properties. Right? I have to be able to use this relation here to express any other flag minor in terms of these particular oops in terms of these particular flag minors here. And so okay, so how do I do that? Well, I have to use this relation. And what is this relation telling me? Let me try to redraw it in a different way. So let's say I have these wires. Let me copy the relation. Okay. So let's say I have uh, uh, let's say I have some triangular region. something like this, somewhere in the middle of my wiring diagram. So there may be a bunch of green wires somewhere above it. Uh, doesn't matter. I only care about this triangular region here. And then let's assume that my wires on the right are labeled by A, B, and C. These kind of three wires that are boundaries of my triangular region. And then uh, let's say that um, let's say that S. I'm gonna draw it in green. Is S is just the set of all wires. Sorry, which are they supposed to be? Uh, yeah, above. That's right. Okay. So let's say that I didn't draw it nicely, but anyways, let's say that S is the set of wires above my region. Uh, and excluding A, B, and C. Uh, so without A, B, and C. Now okay, let me try to let me try to label all the 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 region and adjacent regions. So the label of my triangular region here is I have C and A above, and I also have the whole S, the green set. So there's going to be S, A, C. Now let me also do the same for adjacent regions. This is going to be S, A. So I'm talking these regions are, are the ones adjacent, like immediately adjacent through these boundaries here. Right? There, is, there are these two boundaries, and then there is also these two intersection points. So I'm only talking about the very small neighborhood of my region. SAC, this is going to be uh, SC, this is going to be SBC, and this is going to be SAB, right? And so, okay, and now if I, when I have this triangular region, what I can do is I can do a braid move, right? I can kind of I can take this wire and s move it slightly up so that it goes ab above the intersection point instead of below the intersection point. And so if I draw the corresponding picture, it's going to look like this. Here's my wire B, and then the wire A is going to go here, and the wire C is going to go like this. And then there is going to be a whole bunch of green wires which are going to be labeled by S. And so if I now try to label the regions, well, the 
all the regions except for the triangular region retain their labels. And for the triangular region, instead of AC, SAC, I'm going to have the only wire above it is B. So I'm going to have SB. And so this is, uh, well, now if you look at the relation, you see that on the left hand side we have SAC, which is here, times SB, which is here. So on the left hand side, I'm only taking the two labels of the triangular region as I do the braid move. So let me write down this is called the braid move when I choose a triangular region and I flip it. This is a lot like a flip of a triangulation. Uh, okay. So, and then on the right hand side, you see SAB times SC. So, okay, SAB times SC are, SAB is here and SC is here. So you kind of, uh, you kind of take the two opposite uh, neighbors of my region. And the other term is SA times SBC. So these are the two regions on the other diagonal. So somehow these form a quadrilateral and then you kind of replace this diagonal by this diagonal, although it may sound a little bit confusing. Anyways, that's kind of visually the same, but mm, the point is that, so the conclusion, conclusion is that if you know uh, all regions of your original wiring diagram, right, if you know all of the SA, SC, SAB, SBC, and SAC, well, if you know the corresponding flag miners, then you can find uh, SB just from this relation and vice versa. So you can, as you do these flips, you can, so in other words, if you know all the regions, then no matter how many flips you apply, you're always going to know all the regions. Whenever you apply, apply a flip, you know what's going to be in the new region, what the value, you know, the value of the corresponding flag miner. Um, okay. And so, um, so the point that I'm trying to make is that the claim that I think is going to be in your homework is that uh, any two wiring diagrams can be related by a sequence of braid moves. So for example, for example, when n is equal to three, there is only two wiring diagrams, one that looks like this and the other one that looks like this. And they are related by a braid move on these regions. And as you label, so that's the first claim, this is going to be true in general. And the second claim is that uh, claim two, any j, any set j appears as a region label of some wiring diagram. So the proof of that is that if you have your, like, if you choose your set J, it's like specifying, so if you choose your set J, you kind of know which wires are supposed to go above it and which wires are supposed to go, go below it. And so, and so it's not hard to see that you can always arrange that the, uh, you can always kind of uh, send some desired wires above it and then 
the undesired wires below it so that they no two wires intersect twice and need to intersect exactly once you can kind of always do that so uh, proof of these claims of the claims is an exercise and therefore if you look at these two claims then what you're going to see is that uh, once i well okay let me write the conclusion so corollary is that uh, any uh, p sub j is a, is a can be expressed as a subtraction free expression in any extended cluster and and in fact there is a theorem i mean all my theorems so far are just the same uh, which is that pj is a positive Laurent polynomial in the extended cluster which is again very very much surprising whenever you apply this braid move you divide by sac or sb and somehow it's always going to be cancelled out you're always going to have single monomial in the denominator and so that's basically the the answer to my first question indeed i'm going to check it twice uh, but what about the second question well uh, it's very similar to the grassmannian 2 for grassmannian 2n right we already we already kind of know the answer because uh, the answer is that you need to check uh, the size of an extended cluster is enough because uh, because of the subtraction freeness and the other if you know that these guys are positive real numbers then all the other guys are positive real numbers as well just because this relation is subtraction free and so uh, well which by the way let me try to compute this number which is not hard to do like if you know that any wire any two wires intersect exactly once like for example here how many regions do i get uh, yeah, let me just write down the answer and then i'm going to try to count so the claim is that the size of any extended uh, cluster is just equal to n choose 2 plus n plus 1 that's easy to remember because that's actually n choose 2 plus n choose 1 plus n choose 0. And there is, there is a, a deep reason behind such a, such a sum related to matroids and zone sample tilings and things like that. But yeah, that's the, that's the claim. So for example, if I, if I take um, Why am I not allowed to copy this? If I take my wiring diagram here, then I'm going to compute the number of number of regions. Uh, one, two, three, four. Oops, there is one region that's missing. Okay, two, four. Uh, one, two, three, four. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, and is equal to 4, we get 11 regions, which is hopefully 4 choose 2 plus 4 choose 1 plus 4 choose 0, 6 plus 4 plus 1, that's 11. And, but, uh, okay, now let me try to compare. 
then try to compare uh, the size of an extended cluster, which is n choose 2 plus n plus 1, with the dimension of the flag variety, which is just n choose 2. And for the grass mining, we had a discrepancy of 1 discrepancy because there was the miners were defined up to multiplication by a common scalar. But here, instead of one extra dimension, we get n plus one extra dimensions. And the reason for that is, well, you can, you can rescale all sets of a given size by their own scalar. Why am I so bad at writing scalar? So in particular, if you look at the regions, there are sets, there's the empty set, set of size 1, size 2, size 3, and size n, right? So there's n plus 1 possible sizes, and then, well, this guy is always equal to 1, so but basically you kill n plus 1 dimension by these independent rescalings of sets of different sizes. And if you look at the uh, the relation for flag miners, you can see that every term contains a set of size, well, s plus two elements, and then times uh, uh, s, s union one element. So it's, it's homogeneous. If you rescale all Plukers of the same size by the same value, then this relation is going to be unchanged. Okay, so I think uh, I think this is it. Let me try to let me try to summarize. Uh, let me try to summarize our observations so far, and let me in particular compare the Grassmannian examples with the flag variety examples. So the summary is that in all examples we have uh, clusters, frozen variables, and extended clusters. For the Grassmannian, these are diagonals, these are sides of the polygon, and then these are all, the, all of them together. For the flag variety, these are interior regions, these are boundary regions, and these are all possible regions. Okay, and then the other feature is that in all examples, all extended clusters have the same size, which is somehow related to the dimension of, a, of the space in question. Okay, now the next feature is that for each cluster we have, well, each cluster uh, is indexed by some combinatorial data. So for the Grassmannian, K, well, for the Grassmannian 2n, these are triangulations. For the flag variety, uh, these are wiring diagrams. These are these are all nice combinatorial objects. For the like, I'm not talking right now about the Sama sequence and the freeze patterns. Well, for the freeze patterns, you can kind of see that there, those were like there were these lattice paths. There was a power of two lattice paths. The, these kind of looked like clusters, but uh, yeah, anyways, there is always, for the sum of sequence, it's completely not clear what is combinatorial data attached to a cluster, or what's even a cluster. But anyway, and the other common feature, which I haven't explicitly, explicitly singled out, but it's always present, is a mutation rule. Right? Uh, so what is a mutation rule? Well. For triangulations, uh, we're, we, are, we have flips 
of triangulations. For wiring diagrams, we have braid moves of wiring diagrams. And for, well, for the SAMAS4 sequence, it was the mutation rule was the recurrence relation. So n plus 4 is equal to blah 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 divided by xn. And for the freeze pattern, the freeze patterns, it was when you have a, b, c, d, you have a diamond, then the mutation rule kind of tells you what is d in terms of a, b, and c. d is equal to b, c plus 1 over a. And you can see that in each case, this rule is subtraction free, and also that uh, it changes changes one variable and also changes the combinatorial data in a certain way. Right. There is a certain rule, like you, you make a flip of a triangulation and then you apply a relation for the length of the line segments. You make a braid move and you apply this relation here and etc. Okay. So, um, so that's basically the motivation for introducing cluster algebras. Note that still, even though I, gi I gave like four examples, they look kind of similar, but you can't really pin down, well, maybe you can, but I wouldn't be able to, right? But by just looking at this, how do you, uh, how do you um, fit in the uh, SAMAS4 sequence into like what's the what's the combinatorial data? What are the clusters of the SAMAS4 sequence? So this is not completely trivial. But let me also point out one one other difference. So note that for triangulations, for triangulations, I am allowed to mutate any, well, I'm allowed to flip any diagonal. Take any diagonal, it has a triangle on the left and a triangle on the right, so I can flip the diagonal. So I'm allowed to mutate any diagonal or any element or any element of X of the cluster. But however, for um, for wiring diagrams, for wiring diagrams, some mutations were not allowed. Some mutations were not allowed, right? Because if you if you look at a wiring diagram, then there is there is some regions which are quadrilateral. So if you try to mutate this region, you don't have a relation for that. You have to first mutate this guy, and then and then this guy here becomes a triangle, and then you can mutate that. But you have to kind of apply a sequence. You can't right away mutate this guy yet. So. Yeah, I, I'm going to write yet because for cluster algebras you can somehow fix this issue. You can you can always mutate any any element of the cluster, and there is always going to be a combinatorial rule. Which for this guy it's completely not not clear what to do. And so yeah, so the question which I ask here is well basically the kind of the main question leading to cluster algebras is what is a common generalization of these examples because remember there is some non trivial there's positivity there's laurent phenomenon sometimes there was periodicity how do you 
what is the most general framework where these properties hold how do you yeah it's completely not clear at this point hopefully to you as well so next time in a live lecture i'm gonna introduce cluster algebras and then i'm gonna explain how each of these examples just completely is just a special case of the cluster algebra so that's it i will see you all on wednesday let me know if this lecture was okay or if i should go faster slower uh, change my camera angle or something like this all right see you